Hey everybody, in this week's Select, it's Josh by the way, we take a look at the uncanny valley, a theoretical phenomenon where robots give us the creeps as they get closer to looking human, but still don't seem quite right. And we explore academic research into the creeps, which is pretty cool. So enjoy this episode. Welcome to Stuff You Should Know, a production of iHeartRadio. Hey, and welcome to the podcast. I'm Josh Clark, and there's Charles W. Chuck Bryant, and there's Jerry over there doing the robot, which means this is Stuff You Should Know, robot style. (laughs) I knew Uh, I'd get a laugh out of you sooner or later. Did you do the robot? Can you do the robot? I think I've seen you do pretty bad robot. I don't know about pretty bad (laughs) robot. I can do a pretty great robot. I think that's what you've seen. I can't do any of that stuff. Yeah, I can't really either. I and mean, really, if if your claim to fame is like a really great robot dance, I don't know, maybe take up some other hobbies as well, kind of round that out. <laughs> you don't want that to be the only thing you're good at. Right, because if you list that on a dating site, you might turn ladies off. Yeah, according to eHarmony. Yeah, that's foreshadowing. I love that one, don't you? Yeah, I had some issues with that whole oh, yeah. bit. Yeah. <laughs> we'll get to that. Just a tad. All right, well, let's start at the at the beginning, almost the beginning, Chuck. Let's go back to 1970, which was the beginning of the greatest decade in the history of humanity. Yeah, neither one of us are born yet. I can finally even say that I'm still <laughs> not even born. <laughs> it must feel good. Yeah. Okay, well, welcome to the club, I guess. Yeah, thanks. And in 1970, we're not just going just anywhere in 1970. We're going to Japan in 1970. I bet Japan was pretty cool in the 70s. Yeah. A lot of bell bottoms. A lot of uh, ninja running around still. Yeah. Um, There were uh, calculators being wielded all over the place. Probably. It was a good time. Yeah. Good good time for Japan, right? And one one of the things that was going on in 1970... I could not, for the life of me, find what issue of this journal it came out in, what month. But at some point in 1970, there was an obscure journal, a Japanese academic journal called Energy. And at some point during that year, it published a uh, article by a Japanese roboticist. And his name uh, is Masahiro Mori. Nice. Thank you. I have a lot of practice. <laughs> and uh, Masahiro Omori uh, published this article, and he named it Bukimi no Tani Gensho. Is actually the full name of the whole thing. Yeah. And as we'll see, it's kind of difficult to translate into English, right? And it took many, many years after he wrote this article for it to be translated into English, for anybody to even try to attempt it. So basically, Mori was this uh, roboticist and he wrote this essay, and at the time, he just put it out there and went back to work, started teaching more and more roboticists, a whole new generation of roboticists learned under him. And his his work just kind of sat there, um, unobserved, that article, I should say. And then in 2005, uh, a rough translation of it was leaked out. It wasn't intended for publication, and the world entirely changed, right? Because Masahiro Mori had in his article, put his finger on something that no one had before in his capacity as a roboticist and a human. And that was what we call today the uncanny valley. Yeah, so that's um, the idea that uh, you're making a robot, and Mm -hmm. we'll see this applies to more than just robots. But in his case, you're making a robot, and you want to make it look like a person, um, which uh, I guess not all roboticists do some of them like the clunky Jetson style robots? Sure, like Rosie. But I guess if you're uh, Maury, you're you're on the path to designing lifelike robots, and the closer you get to that lifelike look, everything's going great. Everything's going great. People are like, "This is so cool. This is so cool." Yeah. Then all of a sudden, people go, "Oh, yeah." Like right as it approaches its most, or basically when it reaches its most lifelike capacity, that uh-huh. this whoever's making it can conjure, people are repulsed by it. Yeah, which is 
something that most people who ever hear of the Uncanny Valley are like, yeah, you know, that's, I've noticed that that's happened to me before too. But the thing is, Chuck, it doesn't, it doesn't actually make sense, right? Like we know a robot is a robot. Yeah. So, you know, maybe you could be afraid that it's going to like pick you up and break you in two or something like a cartoon, but that's different than being creeped out by it. Like, why would we be creeped out by a robot? And this is what Maury put his finger on was there's something to this and it doesn't make sense. And he he didn't, it wasn't even just um, this article that he wrote. He, he created a graph as well that's become quite famous that... Um, really kind of gets the point across more than anything else. Yeah, and he wasn't even the first person to to go over this and to put a put some thought to it. Uh, mm-hmm. Freud, of course, cuz he th- liked to think about everything. <laughs> uh he thought about it a little bit and uh, before Freud there was a a German named Ernst Jinscht. Oh, nice. I did not realize that's how his last name should be pronounced. Jinch. That's good stuff. I think I put a T on the end, but the T's in the middle. Jinch. Yeah. I think that's right. I've been uh, saying gench. Well, we'll have to look that up then. <laughs> I think you're, no, I think of the two of us, you're, you got the German down. Uh, and the, he uh, had a little term called umheimlich uh, oh, yeah. that he called it. So like, you know, different languages had different names for it. Mm-hmm. Um, and you go back in time all the way back to like the 17th century and people were, and I guess, you know, robots didn't look super lifelike back then, but whatever their version of lifelike was right. uh, in the 1600s, People were like, Ugh, I don't like that. Why is it looking at me? Yeah, it's got a quill and it's writing things. But like you said, Maury made this graph uh, because he was a roboticist and he thought, you know, let's look at this on a uh, plot it out so we can stare at it. Mm-hmm. And on the X axis, he uh, had human likeness. And then on the Y axis, he had affinity, like whether or not you like the way this thing looks. Right. And just as we're talking about, um, the graph went up and up as uh, things got more lifelike and people mm-hmm. liked the way it looked. And then at a certain point, there is that valley. There's a big dip uh, that really just kind of says it all. Right. And, and again, this all makes sense intuitively, but as we'll see, that's it's been very difficult to prove. And one of the reasons why it's confounded research thus far is because it we we're, we're not even 100% sure what Maury meant by some of the words he chose, at least as far as translating them to English, right? Um, for example, bukimi, right? Yeah. It, it was translated in 2005 as uncanny. But um, again, that, that original translation was not intended for publication, but it leaked out. And so uncanny valley became, you know, the, the, the way we all think of it here in the West. But bukimi... Uh, more closely resembles something like eerie. Like I've seen it explain that um, a word like bukimi means more than, un- uncanny is just weird or remarkable or noteworthy. It's not necessarily something that gives you the creeps. Bukimi is something that, that gives you the creeps. Like Steve Bukimi. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> exactly. Um, so bukimi probably more should be should have been translated the Erie Valley. But by the time uh, an actual official translation that um, Maury signed off on came out in 2012, it, the cat was out of the bag. Everybody knew of it as the Uncanny Valley. And there was no way anybody was going to come back and be like, no, 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 everybody, stop calling it that. It's now the Erie Valley, okay? Right. All right. And it may be one of those things where we're so used to Uncanny Valley now that it's hard to imagine Erie Valley, but... Right, I think that was the issue. Yeah. Like, uh, nobody's going to go along with that. <laughs> so, uh, this graph, like I said, it starts off on that left-hand side, and this is where you have things that are super robotic, um, like, you know, uh, a packaging robot in a factory. Right. Um, that, you know, apparently most people don't have fondness for. I do, because I love mechanical processes. Um, right, right. Okay, so there's there's part of the problem. It's like that's not necessarily the the kind of feeling that Masahiro Mori was talking about. Right. He, he was like, yeah, yeah, you're interested in robotics and robotic arms and the industrial processes, and you love watching how it's made, right? What he was talking about was more like how it resembles a human, and then how it makes you feel in relation to its resemblance of a human, right? 
Well, in that case, it makes me feel nothing because it doesn't look at all like a human. Right. Okay. So that would be at about the origin of the graph. It has no resemblance to a human, really. And it's not eliciting any real affinity in you at all. As far as it looking like a human. Right. But lots of affinity as a thing. That's just, that's called props. <laughs> so you go a little bit uh, further on the graph, and then you have things like um, little stuffed animals. And uh, I know C3PO is, is a common one that's mentioned because sure. C3PO, um, you know, is built to look like a human. He does a great robot. Kind of talks like a human and acts like a human. But when it comes to that face, and as we'll see, the face is kind of the key to all this mm -hmm. um, for the most part. Uh, C-3PO looks nothing like a human in the face. Right. So everything's still good, and people love C-3PO. Right. So if you're looking at the graph, C-3PO is going up in human likeness because he kind of, you know, he's got some some commonality there. And we're feeling affinity for him based on that human likeness. So it's <laughs> he's going up. Yes. Okay. We're going, everything's going pretty well so far, right, Chuck? That's right. Okay, so then we're going to start hitting some areas where things start looking a little more human, a lot more human, I would say, than C-3PO. Like, say, the characters in Moana or Frozen, uh, Pixar characters, that kind of thing, where they look like they're supposed to be human, like they're based on human, but they have very exaggerated features that you would never confuse at first glance for an actual human, right? So they have, like, big eyes, small noses, things that make them cute. Right? And so our affinity for them is going up as the human likeness is going up. Again, things are going really well so far. That's right, because in Moana and Frozen, they look a little bit more like people, and we like them a lot more for that reason. Right. And then, like you said earlier, out of nowhere, the whole thing, this line that's just been going up very pleasantly at, at a nice little slope, just drops downward. Right? And it doesn't drop just downward, it goes actually below the x-axis into negative territory. And now, this is the uncanny valley. That's right. And that's why it has that name, because it's a valley. Right. And this is where those things like really, really lifelike androids live, or um, corpses live, or zombies live. Because uh, Mori, he, he had the idea that if something's moving, it's even creepier than something similar to it that's not moving. So we actually created two lines on this graph, one for things that are animate and one for things that are inanimate. So if you look at this uncanny valley on the inanimate line, the non-moving line, you've got corpses are at the bottom of it. But if you look at the animate line, it's even it dips even further below than the inanimate line, and at the bottom of those are zombies. So dead people up and moving around and saying brains is as creepy as it gets as far as this graph is concerned. Yeah, and he, he Mori wasn't the only one that um, Ernst Jinch that we talked about, the German psychiatrist, uh, he also talked about the fact that if you are looking at something that should not be moving and it moves, mm -hmm. um, I mean, I think we can all agree that... a a baby doll that suddenly turns its head and looks at you. Right. <laughs> probably one of the creepier things you can witness. Right. You know? Yeah, it's about as creepy as it gets. Or um, have you ever been to an open casket funeral? Uh, a few. I'm, I'm not a fan at all. No, it is. It, it, it makes sense. You know, we've really kind of closed or put a lot of space in between us and death way more than we used to have in like the 19th century. No, oh, they, they would sit up with the dead. Sure, right? So this seems to be like kind of a holdover from that. But if you've ever been to a, a, an open casket funeral and have just stared at the corpse long enough, like maybe its arm or its fingers or something, your brain is so anticipating that they it's about to start moving that sometimes you can creep yourself out and, and make yourself think you did actually see it move. You'll also be asked to leave the funeral. <laughs> well, you shouldn't be like giving a commentary about this out loud, but you can, you yeah. know, to you can do it to pass the time <laughs> in the funeral if you're looking to, to kill some time. Uh, so here's the thing with all this. Um, we know this happens because everyone kind of has this feeling, but n no one and all this research has been done and no one is exactly sure why this happens. So, uh, Maury's essay, and especially once it was translated, um, a lot of research started happening in this area. And uh, it's problematic, though, because 
uh, there, there are a few different problems. Uh, one is, well, it's, it's subjective. This dependent variable, whether you have an affinity for something, is very subjective. So it's hard to kind of nail that down scientifically. Right. All right. So then number two is human likeness, right? This is the independent variable? Yeah. And if you have human likeness, like, what does that mean? Like, what looks human? What doesn't look human? The, like, we haven't pinned that down. So, like, if you can't pin these, the dependent variable down and the independent variable down, it makes it really tough to study. Correct. And then there's a third one, too. I love this one. Yeah, the third one is, uh, you know, the original hypothesis. It doesn't have a mathematical model that, like, really specifies the shape of this curve. Right. So, uh, it's still hypothetical, I guess. Right. Which means that, so if you look at Maury's graph, it was, he just basically made a line, right? It wasn't based on any studies he'd done. The whole thing was really an essay more than anything else. Um, so researchers who are trying to seriously study this scientifically have nothing that they're actually trying to place their findings against, which leads to, uh, put it puts them at risk for what's called the Texas sharpshooter fallacy. Yeah greatest name fallacy around. And um, it's it's based on the idea that uh, if you take a, a sharpshooter out in Texas and have them shoot at the side of a barn a bunch of times, some of them are inevitably going to hit the barn. And then the Texas sharpshooter walks up and then draws the bullseye around the bullets that he already sunk into the side of the barn. That's the Texas sharpshooter fallacy. It's ignoring data like the ones where he missed the barn in favor of ones that fall into what you're looking for the the bullet holes in the barn. You could do the same thing with the the um, data that you get from testing the uncanny valley if you have no model to fit it into already. Yeah, I think they would have done better if they would have just instead of trying to prove something, uh, to maybe just research and call it a thought experiment. Right. You know. Right. But people are taking it seriously, and we'll we'll talk about some of this research right after this, Chuck. All right, so we're back. And despite the fact that this is really tough to study, it's not even established that it's a real thing in everyone's mind, by the way. Um, there, there are people out there who are really studying the Uncanny Valley and trying to pin it down. Yeah, one of these people is uh, at Dartmouth College, a psychologist, and I didn't look up their mascot. The, um, the, uh, the pub darts. The fighting pub darts at Dartmouth College. We're going to hear from Dartmouth. Uh, but her name is Talia Wheatley. Um, and she's done some research and has found that it's not just like some uniquely Western thing or American thing. Uh, it's kind of all over the world. She studied tribes in Cambodia. And they have these same sensitivities to these things that look human but aren't human. Mm -hmm. uh, and they've even found that, and if, I think it kind of all comes down to the eyes, but they found just looking at the eye can be enough. Yeah. Um, somebody can tell whether it's a human or not just looking at a picture of the eye, right? Yeah, and that's where I think people lose credibility in, and we'll talk about movies and sculpture and all that stuff, but they, they just never get, you can't get the eyes right. Like, you can't put life in lifeless eyes. Yeah. No Only matter how God. hard they try. Only God can. <laughs> uh, and there was this other experiment where they... Um, you know, like where you can morph a face uh, digitally or whatever. Like that Michael Jackson black or white video. Yeah. I yeah. think some people were creeped out by that even. <laughs> sure. Uh, but they would show this doll image and it would morph into a human face. And basically they would have people mark where they, uh, where they thought that it would look more human than doll. And it, you know, it landed at about the 65% mark as far as morphing into human. Which, I mean, you can't really apply that necessarily, but just... It's interesting. Offhand, 65% point is about where the uncanny valley happened in Maury's mind. Yeah, I would think it would be higher than that. Yeah. But um, yeah, still super interesting. 
Um, and you were saying that the eyes, you're, and that's what you're betting on, is that it's going to turn out to be the eyes, right? Yeah. So trying to investigate what constitutes uh, human likeness, there's a, a researcher named Angela Tinwell, and she basically says, like, yes, it's all about the upper facial features and that we we detect those, we we read those. And so if there's any anything that's even just slightly off in, like, you know, the eyes or the brows or the wrinkles that form, um, that will lead to the the uncanny valley. That's the creeping part. Or the smile, too, she also says. Well, yeah, and all these things kind of come down to evolution. And her point is, like, you can't battle millions of years of evolution that has honed our our dumb little human brain to detect something that's off about a face. Right. Uh, it's just too much to overcome, basically. Right. Uh, this other researcher named uh, Carl F. McDorman, who's from the University of in Indiana, who oh, actually, users. he's basically like dedicated his career to this now. Um, he found that uh, certain kinds of people, if you do like a personality inventory before testing for uncanny valley sensitivity, yeah, some types of people are predictably more sensitive to the uncanny valley than others. Specifically, he found that uh, very religious people. That makes total sense. Yeah. Neurotic people. Yeah. Um, and uh, people with high sensitivity to animal reminders. I don't even know what that is. It's basically anything that reminds you that, hey, you're super civilized and you drive a car and you know how to play poker. Um, but you're still an animal just as much as that ape over there is. Right. An animal reminder. Um, people who are sensitive to that kind of thing tend to go off on the uncanny valley as well. And then people who are anxious are more likely to experience the uncanny valley as far as McDormand is concerned. Yeah, that anxious thing makes sense too because they're probably just more prone to be, uh, I don't know, just have a reaction to a lot of things like this. Right. But But we should say... The science in all this, the fact that the independent and the dependent variable are still not defined. The science is this. This is like the scientific equivalent of that backward, over the head, half court basketball shot. Yeah, that's the level of science that these people are carrying out at this point. Because they're they're a lot of them, sadly, are conducting experiments based on something that, again, doesn't have a, a set dependent or independent variable. So how can you do that is my question. Well, yeah, I mean, because in each experiment, they're going to be using different uh, stimuli, um, different faces. Right. Whether it's a doll or a wax figure or a CGI character, and then they're going to be doing different things and have different expressions, and each person has their own subjective take. So it is a very tough thing to kind of nailed down. Yeah, and I think some of them are actually trying to form the basis of this field of study right now. They're doing the 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 groundwork, but I think some of them also are like just chasing headlines. Like there's no better way to get get into the media cycle with your study than than releasing some findings on the uncanny valley. Oh, is it? People just eat that up. Sure. <laughs> They love it. Uh, one thing I thought was interesting was um, at Princeton, they uh, tried this with monkeys, and they found the same thing happen when they had these uh, realistic-looking but fake monkey faces. Mm -hmm. The monkeys were like, ah, ah, and turned away. Right. Um, it did make me think, though, like all the you, – you've seen these situations where like an orphaned animal has a, a creepy puppet mother. Yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. And they seem to like that, but however, and this is a bit of a spoiler, but um, toward the end of this article, it points out that human babies don't have this reaction at first either and that it's mm -hmm. kind of learned. So maybe right. that explains it. Maybe. With the animals. I know you're talking about that that cage, like wire monkey mother. It's super creepy. Is it a black and white photo? Well, no. I mean, they do. there's all kinds of animals. Well, they'll, they'll have like a fake tiger or a fake duck or whatever. Huh. Uh, just so the animal will feed or, I mean, it's usually an animal that, that milks from the mother, I guess. I see. But um, it's a common thing they do for orphaned uh, milk feeding or breastfed animals. And they're always creepy, huh? Well, I mean, to us. Yeah. But to a dumb baby monkey, they're just like, <laughs> right. sweet, give me the teat. Yeah. <laughs> There's a t-shirt. <laughs> Maybe even a band name. 
Sweet, give me the teat. Yeah. Yeah, that kind of falls into the long band name category. That's yeah, fine. for sure. Uh, but here's the thing is not uh, everyone agrees with this uh, whole thing. Like you said earlier, there's a man named David Hansen, uh, and he's a roboticist as well in Plano, Texas. Mm-hmm. And uh, he did a very, very basic study. Uh, it was a survey where they showed uh, images of two different robots uh, that were animated to simulate human facial expressions mm-hmm. and basically just asked, hey, what do you think of this? And 70% <laughs> said, I like them. <laughs> yeah. I can see said, why people had trouble with this study, though. Yeah, he said not one person said they were disturbed. Yeah. So, okay. Sounds good. For the most part, though, studies into the Uncanny Valley are like, no, nah, we, we're finding something here. Yeah. Although we should be suspicious of ones that basically show the Uncanny Valley that Maury just graphed out of his, like, with freehand. Right. Like, if you if you come across a study that shows that same thing, they're probably cherry-picking data. Were you about to say out of his butt? <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> uh, there was another study, Edward Schneider uh, at... Uh, SUNY Potsdam in New York. I bet they don't even have a mascot. Um, (laughs) They got together 75 (laughs) characters from cartoons and video games, uh, everyone from uh, Mickey Mouse to Lara Croft, Mm -hmm. and um, who is very attractive, by the way. Uh, She's a computer character. Yeah. Are you talking about Angelina Jolie? Well, no, I'm talking about playing Tomb Raider. Oh, I never played. Yeah, when it first came out, you know, I played Tomb Raider, and I was like, oh. Wow, look at her. Laura Croft is kind of hot. <laughs> she Well, she's she gets a lot of stuff done. That's very attractive. <laughs> I'm not sure what that means. Well, she travels a lot. Oh, she, oh, uh, oh, sure. She's an independent person. Yeah, that's what I meant. I was attracted to her mind and her adventures. Right. Uh, so anyway, they asked people in the study um, how attractive do you think these characters are or how repulsive do you think they are. Mm-hmm. And again, there was um, a graph with a dip in it at a certain point, as you would expect. Yep. Careful. Careful, everybody. (laughs) So if you're you're a robot designer, right? One of the things, like even back in his essay written in 1970, Masahiro Mori said, um, there's, there's problems here with movement. There's problems here with the smile. It has something to do with the face, right? Yeah. Um, and somebody else said, I, I don't remember who it was, but there's there always seems to be a lag time between how realistic a designer can make a robot and how realistic a uh, an engineer can make that robot look. Yeah. Right? And that, that disconnect in Maury's mind was a big part of the Uncanny Valley. But he also seemed to focus on the smile on the eyes. And one of the things that's at stake, like, b- besides this just being, like, an interesting topic of discussion, like, there are actual real-world implications for this whole thing, right? Like, if you're a robot designer, you want to create something that's not going to freak people out because the whole purpose of robots is to interact with humans and you want them to interact with humans. I should say lifelike looking at robots, right? Because like Ford Motor Company is never going to buy an Android that looks human to just work on an assembly line <laughs> when they can get the same thing that does the same job cheaper when it just looks like a robotic arm or something, right? Yeah. The the whole purpose of a lifelike looking robot is because that robot's being designed to interact with humans. And if you are going to run into this spot, some people say it's not even a valley. Some people think it's insurmountable, a cliff or a wall. So if you're going to run up against this, you, you want to figure out how to overcome it because you don't want to creep people out with your creations. Well, and you don't want to spend a lot of money um to develop a uh, robotic Walmart greeter at every store mm-hmm. uh, because it's it's happening. Like, this is coming, people. Yeah, there's a robot called Geminoid F or Actroid F, depending on who you ask. I've also seen her called Ellie. And she is out of this lab by a guy named Hiroshi Ishiguro. And he is probably the world's leading roboticist. If you've seen any lifelike android, it probably came out of this guy's lab, right? Yeah. And she is starting to get out there in the world. She's been a debriefer of soldiers coming back from war with PTSD based on the idea that they might 
share more with a robot that they knew was just a robot than they would an actual human. Yeah. Um, she's in a play. She stars as an android. Good role. <laughs> right? <laughs> and then there's uh, Casper. There's a little robot called Casper. Yeah, Casper is uh, a robot boy uh, with a great cause uh, created to help children with autism learn to read facial emotions. Um, right. If you look up photos of both of these, uh, uh, Geminoid F mm -hmm. uh, looks great. And really, like, Ishiguro is doing great, great work. Yeah, he really is. Um, Casper looks terrifying. Right. And so Casper is creepy, but that's not his purpose at all, right? No. Of course. His not. purpose is to, like, teach kids with autism how to connect. But if he's repelling them... <laughs> Through this uncanny valley, he's defeating the purpose. Well, they should go to Ishiguro and say, hey, we have this great cause. Can you make us something that doesn't look like the stuff of nightmares? Right, exactly. I wonder if Casper has been um, effective, you know? I don't know. I don't know. Ooh. Now I feel bad I didn't look into that. Well, uh, I just, I don't know. He's very creepy looking. I agree wholeheartedly. It's kind of like, no, he's not finished. Get back to the drawing board. <laughs> Either that or, and this is what Maury said, like, go the other way. Like, just make him not um, human at all. Just cute or approachable. Right. So, the roboticists are not the only ones who are facing this, Chuck. There is a, a, a pretty powerful, moneyed contingent of people who are interested stakeholders in overcoming the uncanny valley, or at least figuring out if it's totally insurmountable and that is hollywood yeah um hollywood has a uh sort of a rich history of getting it wrong when it comes to creepy cgi characters mm -hmm. um pixar had their very first short film actually it's called tin toy uh it's a little five minute short and they showed it to this you know this preceded toy story and everything yeah it was actually kind of like the the outline of toy story's plot yeah, but they showed it to test audiences, and they made the mistake of making uh, the baby, Billy, look too realistic, and everyone loved Tin Toy, and everyone hated Billy. Yeah. Have you seen it? Yeah. Yeah. So I hate I'm, Billy. He, yeah, he's pretty hateable, for sure, and he is the antagonist, but he, he struck some chord with viewers that, that Pixar did not mean to strike. Right. And they actually, I mean, this is extraordinarily fortunate for Pixar. Oh, sure. This is very early on in their history. And um, they uh, they learned from it, actually. They're like, okay, note to self, don't try to make any of these characters lifelike. Let's go a different direction. And so they came up with those um, exaggerated features that that we've all just come to know and love. Yeah, which was a great, great direction to go in, uh, yeah. obviously, because well, they've had tons of success with that model. Right. I, you can make the case that it, it may have saved the, the company, because other companies and other movies, for sure, have not been nearly as fortunate. Yeah, uh, one of the first big uh, photoreal uh, computer animated movies was Final Fantasy, colon, The Spirits Within. Mm -hmm. uh, you should never have a colon in your movie title, by the way. <laughs> so that was the first mistake. Right. Uh, but... This one was from 2001 and uh, based on the video game. And it was uh, off-putting to a lot of people. And it was a big, big bomb uh, for Columbia Pictures. And But this is before Uncanny Valley had really been established, uh, before Maury's essay was translated. So mm -hmm. reviewers didn't quite know what to say. Now they would just <laughs> say, we've tumbled into the Uncanny Valley again. All right. Uh, but they would say things like uh, Peter Travers, great uh, reviewer from Rolling Stone, said, at first, it's fun to watch the characters. Ellipsis. Ellipse? Ellipse. Ellipse. But <laughs> what's an ellipsis? Is that two of them? A couple of them. <laughs> uh, but then you notice a coldness in the eyes, a mechanical quality in the movements, familiar voices emerging from the mouths of replicants erect a distance. Yeah. So he's describing the Uncanny Valley. He just didn't have the name of it yet. Right. Um, and then a couple of years later, you had the Polar Express. Ugh. Which became, I think, even more famous than Final Fantasy. Oh, totally. As far as the Uncanny Valley goes. But again, it's like you said, you know, the reviewers didn't know how quite to put their finger on it. And I, I'm not quite sure how Final Fantasy was done, but I know that Polar Express used similar um, software and hardware to what 
um, roboticists are using now where it's like motion capture, but rather than translating the motion to the robot, it's translating the motion into like a, a digital 3D rendering of the character, right? Yeah. So Polar Express was really, really expressive, but not quite there. So it fell really hard in the uncanny valley. And um, I think uh, David Germain of the Associated Press uh, compared the kids in this heartwarming family Christmas movie to the children from Village of the Damned. Yeah. Which is not what you want. It's not at all what the studio wanted. And it, I think it, it lost a pretty decent amount of money. Yeah, uh, there was another one. Uh, uh, and these are all, by the way, courtesy of Robert Zemeckis. He really had his... He went all in on this technology. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know why. I think he just... I think sometimes you, as a artist, you can get so wrapped up in the coolness of, wow, look what we can do now, that you don't step back and look at what you're doing. Like, should should we be doing this? <laughs> uh, because he also uh, had a part in the uh, Beowulf movie in 2007 that was a huge bomb. Um, and the New York Times said this about that. People who are meant to be enraged or who are at risk of plummeting to their deaths just look a little out of sorts. When it was over, I felt relieved to be back in the company of uncreepy flesh and blood humans again. Mm -hmm. Sad. And then, uh, did you see The Adventures of Tintin? Yeah, I really liked Tintin, though. I did, too. I think Spielberg, I mean, there is that uncanny valley a little bit, but uh, the story and the movie were so good, he overcame that, I think. I was about to say, I think Spielberg has come the closest to to overcoming that chasm uh, of anybody. But did he do it through good storytelling or through the eyes? I, I don't know. I yeah. don't know if it, I don't know if it was a combination of the two. Um, I, I don't know, but it is extraordinarily, it's a, an extra, so you know those, that, that, that stuff you'll see every once in a while where somebody does like what Beavis and Butthead would actually look like in real life or what Charlie Brown would oh, look yeah. like in those real life. Fantastic. Right. So it it still has kind of got a cartoonish quality to it. It's the same thing with the Tintin movie, but it was like a, it was as if you were living in a dimension where humans looked somewhat cartoonish. Is that making any sense, or does that just make the whole thing even harder to understand? No, I get that. So so he somehow was like, here, I'm not trying to to nail what humans look like. I'm going to take you to another world where these people live. And if you lived in this world, you would look like this too. It's it's weird. It's like he he bridged an uncanny valley that doesn't exist in this dimension. Yeah, he built a temporary disintegrating bridge across the uncanny valley. Right. Uh, I think the biggest example in recent years was, or the one that got the most attention was in uh, Rogue One. Did you see that? The Star Wars movie? I haven't seen any of the new Star Wars ones except for, I've seen the first uh, six, I guess, is how oh, okay. you heard it. But none of the, the two new new ones. No. Uh, well, in Rogue One, they completely bring back to life Grand Moff Tarkin, who uh, was played by the the deceased Peter Cushing. Mm -hmm. And they brought him back as a character in this movie. And in the theater, like when he when it first happens, he's got his back to you and it's sort of in the shadows. And you're like, oh, wow, like that's pretty cool. And I didn't know that they would do that. But they they got too comfortable, I think, mm -hmm. and uh, showed too much and gave him too many lines and too much light. And then it, it became Uncanny Valley. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> oh, yeah, for sure. Think about poor Peter Cushing's family having to see that. Yeah, I don't know. How I'll bet they works. just weep during that, that movie. Well, I'm curious about like life rights and image rights and stuff like that, if they had to Get that cleared. I don't even know. There, I'm sure there's a backstory there. Oh, Cushing was famously mellow. Oh, was he? <laughs> he would have taken a draw off his doobie and been like, it's whatever, man. Yeah, I think he spent the last year of his, of his life on his uh, weed farm in Northern California. Right. <laughs> uh, what about this Mars Needs Moms? I had never, ever heard of that movie. And so <laughs> I, I went and watched the trailer and I still was like, I have no idea what this is. Yeah. You know uh, that comic strip, Bloom County? Well, you know, I'm a huge, huge, lifelong Bloom County fan. Oh, okay. So, Berk uh, So maybe you know how to say the last name. It's Berkeley Breathed or Breathed? I always breathed? said Breathed, but uh, I don't know if I've ever heard it said out loud. Breathed sounds nice. 
Let's go with that. So Berkeley Brethren, the person, the guy who did uh, Bloom County. Yeah. He wrote a book, a children's book called Mars Needs Moms. And basically, Mars had some sort of shortage of moms. So the Martians came and kidnapped human moms. And it was up to the human kids to go get their moms back from Mars, right? Pretty yeah. cute little premise. But they took it and ran it through Zemeckis' nightmare mill. <laughs> um, That's what he called, called his company, right? Image Movers Digital was the was the trade name of it. But oh. everybody knew to just steer clear of this place, right? Yeah. And this was like the apex or, or the, what's the opposite of the apex? The valley? I guess so. The deepest part of the CGI valley of the Uncanny Valley, right? It was what, what the stuff that they created. It was so off. And just so spectacularly and colossally off that when I guess Disney came along and bought this company, they came in, looked around and said, we're shutting you down. This movie's it. We're not doing this anymore. What you guys are doing here is wrong. Um, and you're all going to jail. Yeah, here's my thoughts on that. I watched the trailer and it didn't look any worse than any of the other ones to me. And in fact, <clears throat> I don't know the characters' names, but there's a kid and then there's this one kind of chubby guy. Right. In Mars. Yeah. The chubby guy looked pretty good, actually, I thought. I think this was a victim. I bet the movie sucked really bad. Yeah. And I think it was the last straw at the end of all these Uncanny Valley failures. Yeah, because this, again, this is the same company that had created um, a Polar Express. Yeah, the Nightmare Factory. <laughs> and A Christmas Carol did not do very well either. No. So, yeah, I think it, it definitely bore the brunt of its predecessors as well. Yeah. I but I thought this was as bad as it got. If you ask me, I totally saw what what Disney saw with this one. Yeah, anytime I, something is marked as the thing that killed the thing, right? It's always just the last thing. Yeah, you're right. You know. Yeah. Anyway, but it could have also been the thing that saved the thing <laughs> had they gotten it right. You know, <laughs> that's true. So, like I said, Maury was like, and every time I say Maury now, unless I say it like Maury, just saying Maury. Sounds like an I old Jewish guy. Think I think of the <laughs> wig salesman in Goodfellas. Yeah, Maury. Robert De Niro's <laughs> like, give me my for money. And Ray Liotta's just in there laughing because Maury's two pay falls off. Yeah. Imagine that guy is the guy who came up with the Uncanny Valley, okay? He's it gives a whole different spin to it, right? Yeah. So um, Maury says, um, just don't even try, guys. Like, you're never going to be able to do this. Even if you can, we're so far away from it. Yeah. And this is in 1970, he was saying it. And it still holds true now. Yeah, yeah. We're so far away from this that that just maybe put your put your emphasis elsewhere. And the example he gave was, say, like a prosthetic hand, right? Yeah. Rather than trying to create a lifelike prosthetic hand that that was in danger of creeping people out, which is... The opposite of what somebody wearing a prosthetic hand wants when they're walking around with a prosthetic hand. He said, you know, maybe choose some like like wood, well sanded, beautifully grained wood. Yeah. In the shape of a human hand. It gets the point across. This is my hand. I lost my hand. I don't have my hand. But there's nothing to be creeped out about here. It's kind of beautiful looking, isn't it? Yeah. That was Maury's take. And a lot of people side with him as well. As a matter of fact, you know, I said, I think at the beginning that he was already an established roboticist when he wrote The Uncanny Valley in 1970. And he went on to teach a lot of people, roboticists, or a lot of roboticists as well. And um, that very famous robot, uh, Asimo, Asimo, uh -huh. you know the one I'm talking about? Mm, he was one so. of the first ones that could jog in place, and he was kind of humanoid for sure, but very cute, all white, shiny, lacquer, plastic. Yeah. You've seen him before. Um, he was created by one of Maury's students, who clearly subscribed to Maury's theory that you you're not going to you're not going to overcome the uncanny valley so just make these things exaggerated and non-human like yeah and you'll you'll have people love your robot yeah i think that's a good tech yeah uh all right well, we're going to take another break here and then uh come back and finish up with a little bit we're going to take a step back and just talk generally about creepiness
All right, so I promised that we would talk about creepiness. So that's what we'll do. <laughs> you promised, Chuck. The creeps, uh, such a great phrase. Everyone says it, gives me the creeps. It's yeah. just such a, it just, it's one of those phrases that sums things up so perfectly. It's livid as a fresh bruise. <laughs> and um, we have Charles Dickens to thank for this, evidently, because mm-hmm. he gets credit for using the creeps. Uh, and David Copperfield in 1849 uh, people had had this feeling before, this sort of unpleasant off, you know, what it feels like to get the creeps. But they said things like eel-like or clammy. Not bad. Not bad. But if you said, Ugh, that thing makes me feel eel-like today, people would be like, what the heck are you talking about? Right. I think also you would use that to describe somebody who gave you the creeps as well. Like, that guy's really clammy. <laughs> you know what I mean? Sure. Well, that means you're touching them, though. Like like Peter Lorre would be clammy or eel-like in some of his characters. Oh. Well, you know? Like Peter Lorre. I do, too. All right. Um, so, everybody understands that there is such a thing as the creeps, right? hmm But we don't understand why we get the creeps still to this day. And again, this is important and relates to the Uncanny Valley because another way to put the creeps is negative affinity. Remember, affinity was the x-axis. Yeah. And when the valley dropped down below the x-axis, you dipped into negative affinity. You dip into the creeps. The creeps, exactly, right. So you talked about um, Ernst Jünsch. Yeah. Yeah, did I get it? Sure. He, he was probably the first person to actually sit down and study the creeps or creepiness. I bet he was creepy himself. I don't know. I think he was just kind of a neat thinking man, right? So Jünsch... Man, I like saying his name a lot more now. (laughs) He uh, wrote an essay in 1906 called On the Psychology of the Uncanny. Yeah. And that's the English translation. Um, The German word he used, like you said, is unheimlich. Is that right? Uh, M, not N, unheimlich. Unheimlich. Yeah. Okay. Nice, you're Um, getting better. Thank you. Uh, he, He used that word, and unheimlich is a variation of the word heimlich. Um, which is not just to say the maneuver, it means something else entirely, which is homey or familiar, right? Yeah. Unheimlich is the opposite of that. It's something strange and foreign, and very frequently it's translated into uncanny here in the West, here, here in, in in England. Yeah, and he uh, <laughs> he has uh, he thought a lot about this, and one of the things that he noted, which I th- thought was pretty interesting was that people that he thought were more intellectually discriminating um, are more prone to have these uncanny experiences Mm -hmm. because they're critical thinkers about the world. Right. So uh, that makes sense. Like, just they pay attention maybe a little more. Yeah, or they're curious. Like, they're they're like, why am I creeped out? Let me get to the bottom of this rather than, oh, I'm creeped out. I'm going to go eat a, a whole thing of Chips Ahoy and hide under the covers. Right. Uh, he, he also actually went even further and said it's, it's possible that all of humanity's knowledge has been accrued over these millions of years from the the people investigating what's behind this creepiness. Yeah. It's a pretty weird and neat theory of knowledge. Well, yeah. And speaking of theories, there are a bunch of theories on creepiness um, and why this happens. And I think they're all pretty interesting. Yeah. Uh, the first one is called pathogen avoidance theory. And we talked earlier about evolution, and um, this one kind of fits into that bucket. Uh, Basically, a (laughs) warning that we have evolved uh, to have in our brain that says that person is off, they are diseased even, you don't want to go near them. Right. You want to avoid that pathogen. It makes sense. Yeah. It's pretty pretty approachable. Sure. Um, there's another one that I, I've seen that's, I think, fairly recent, and it's the idea that things give us the creeps when um, when they're trying to non-verbally mimic people. Yeah. And so, like, a robot doesn't do it, so we're like, oh, that's unsettling. Or s- somebody who you would describe as clammy or eel-like maybe overdoes it a little bit. Yeah. Like, they're trying to fit in. It's not natural to them. Yeah. And that can give you the creeps as well. That makes sense, but it doesn't really encompass everything. It's definitely not a, a unified theory of creepiness. It just seems to kind of inhabit one corner of the creepy spectrum. 
Yeah. Uh, there's another one called Violation of Expectation. Um, this is like, you know, you've shaken hands with thousands of people over your life. But if you go and you shake a hand and you don't know that you're going to get a prosthetic hand, mm -hmm. it may give you the creeps. Right. Uh, and that is probably very fleeting because you might just say, oh, oh, okay, well, it doesn't give me the creeps now, but it, it's just unexpected for me. And actually, you said that was fleeting, right, Chuck? So I think it was you or somebody who said that creepiness, what gives us the creeps one time might not give us the creeps later on. Yeah. Which will kind of come into play later. Like er Ernst Jünsch, basically, he laid the groundwork for the study of creepiness and it seems to have gotten a lot of it right, right out of the gate. Yeah, and like you said, if it if it doesn't give you the creeps later, then that would fit neatly into the violation of expectation because then you can change your expectation. Right, exactly. Yes, yes. Um, another one's mortality salience theory. This is a good one. Yeah, this one Maury and uh, Freud both subscribed to. And it basically said that um, we, when we encounter like a robot or an automaton in Freud's day, um, they remind us of dead people which in turn gets our mind to thinking about how we're going to die one day. And so all of a sudden we find ourselves in the uncanny valley. Right. Which, again, raises another, sorry uh, for the sidetrack, but raises another of Yunch's points. Um, is uncanniness inherent in the object or is it inside the observer who's experiencing the creeps or uncanniness? I think right? it's in the observer. Yeah, I think it is too, which would explain why it can go away when yeah. you when you come to experience it again. Yeah. Like this when you go through the when you shake the same prosthetic hand again, you it's not creepy the second time. It might even be interesting. Or why some people might uh not experience it at all. Like someone might sit there and see a doll and the doll's head turns and looks at them and they're like, neat. Right. Which How means, much for that doll? <laughs> which means you've just met a serial killer. <laughs> <laughs> and then the dolls creeped out after that. <laughs> uh, this one I like, the um, even though I can never say this word for some reason, anthropomorphism. Nice job. Uh, dehumanization dichotomy, which basically as we attribute these human attributes to the robot until we realize that they don't have them. Right. So like so, we're looking at this robot that looks like a person. We're saying, oh, look, it's just like a human. And they're walking and they're talking and they're smiling and then oh god. Look at their eyes. Their eyes are dead. <laughs> Look at the eyes. They don't they don't have any internal thoughts at all. They're not human. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, uncanny valley. Which is a little bit about expectation too, I think. Those are crossover a little, I think. Sure. And so creepiness, I think, especially the modern incarnation of creepiness, this is my these are my thoughts. Right. They seem to be they represent a crossroads, right? Where evolutionarily, creepiness, I think, um, was probably, it, it, it alerts us. We're on alert when something's creeping us out. We're really focused on that thing right then. Yep. But we're also bound by society not to just turn and run from anything that could conceivably be a threat. You can also take it a little further and say that evolutionarily speaking, it would not make sense for us to turn and run from every single thing that could conceivably be a threat before we've identified it as a threat because we would be using up a lot of calories and energy and we would have to find more food than we do. It'd be inefficient, right? So we're kind of bound socially to stand in place until we identify something as a threat or not, in which case during this period, that's when we experience creepiness. Yeah, and I think everyone has experienced this. Um, like you're in a coffee shop or something, and like some super creepy dude comes in. Mm -hmm. And if you're like me, you're just like, um, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep my eye on that guy. <laughs> I'm, I'm not going gonna... to bolt and run, but I might stand near the door. Sure. You know? I, I might get my car keys ready. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. Uh, it is. It's this weird social contract. Um, and, you know, I feel bad for people that just inherently look a little creepy. Well, yeah, well, let's talk about that. Yeah. So there is these there are these researchers from Knox College who did what they build as the first empirical study of creepiness and this is in 2016. Such a great study. And um it was an online survey, lot, very little heavy lifting, but it was a pretty pretty cool survey. Uh it, it was in four parts. And um 
what they found overall was that, yeah, physical characteristics, physical traits that are almost stereotypically linked to creepy people do have an effect. They are creepy um, as far as as the, the participants in this study are concerned. Yeah. So the first section said, hey, you know, what what is the likelihood that this person is creepy? And there's like, you know, descriptions of them. There's 44 different behaviors, right? Yeah. Um, and the second part was participants rated the creepiness of 21 different occupations. Love to see that list. Um, the third section, it said, list two hobbies that you think are creepy. <laughs> I love that they only needed two. <laughs> it was open-ended, too. <laughs> And then the last section, um, the participants said whether or not they agreed with 15 statements about the nature of creepy people. Yeah. And overall, again, like they found like, yes, if you have physical traits that people find creepy, like bulging eyes or you lick your lips a lot or, you know, you you arch your fingers and then just kind of tap them together a lot. <laughs> okay. It, it's kind of creepy, but the the Knox researchers concluded that those aren't creepy necessarily in and of themselves. It's when it's in conjunction with other creepy behavior that somebody comes across as creepy. Right. Uh, and of course, the one behavior they put in here, I think that was probably universally creepy, was uh, someone who persistently steers the conversation toward a sexual topic. Right. Yeah. You don't, you don't do that. They, uh, they also found... Uh, they also found 95% of participants, and this is like, I think, 1,800 and some, no, 1,341 people. 95% of them said that men were more likely to be creepy than women. Yeah, I think and, that's generally true. I, um, I don't remember getting the creeps a lot in my life by uh, strictly from the appearance of a woman. Right. But a lot of dudes on a weekly basis give me the creeps. Sure. But we, we should say, so there's a website called girl.com, G-U-R-L.com. Yeah. And they went on to Reddit and found a thread somewhere that they wrote a blog post about. And now we're reporting on it. So it's really come full circle. <laughs> but it was a thread about how women can be creepy. And it was written by dudes. And um, there are some things that apparently are universally creepy uh, among boys with women, right? Yeah. Women that are too needy can be creepy. Women who use baby talk too much or who, quote, never leave a guy alone. Yeah, I, I just, uh, I'm just going to go ahead and dump that right into the trash bin. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's my only comment on that. Okay. What about eHarmony? I mean, if you come home and, and uh, Glenn Close is in your kitchen boiling your pet bunny. Well, that's a threat. Yeah, that's not even creepy. That's just a threat. Right. Although I will say in Fatal Attraction, the um, the scene where she is sitting there clicking the light on and off, listening to Madam Butterfly, mm -hmm. that was, that was kind of creepy. I was trying to think of like a, a creepy woman. I really couldn't come up with anybody. Well, these are creepy behaviors though, you know? Yeah. Not like Glenn Close, Close walked into the room and you're like, ooh, I don't know about that. Right, right. Right, there's a difference, right? The, uh -huh. There's a difference between genuine creepiness and just doing creepy things. Yeah. I think it is much harder for women to be creepy than men. Cannot think of a single actual creepy woman. No. I'd like to hear from people, though. Yeah. <laughs> uh, eHarmony. So, we talked about Reddit. Now we're going to talk about eHarmony. Right. They had an article where they wrote advice to dudes... Uh, it was called How to Avoid the Creep Zone. Right. Um, and their advice was for your hobbies that you list <laughs> to be just sort of vanilla. Right. Don't like, and even if you are an amateur taxidermist, maybe don't put that down. Right. They said it, it, it can be attractive for a guy to have an off-the-beaten-path hobby. And one of the examples they gave of an off-the-beaten-path hobby was collecting punk records. <laughs> But don't get weirder than that. Yeah, and, if, you know, taxidermy in and of itself, some people might say is super creepy. We did an episode on that. Other mm -hmm. people might say, no, it's just, just beautiful artwork. Right. But Norman Bates was into taxidermy for a reason in Psycho. Right. It was uh, unsettling. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And so, um, there, 
the the Knox people who who carried out this survey, the Knox University researchers, they basically said, "Here's what we think it is. Here's creepiness explained." And what they explained was what can be called as the threat ambiguity um, theory. Yeah, this this one, I think we kind of <clears throat> put a cherry on top on this one. Yeah, we really did. Like it, it's just basically where you are creeped out by something because your hackles are raised right then, and it's because you haven't determined whether that thing's a threat or not. Yep. Right? There's another one, though, that I subscribe to. I think it is finally the unified theory of creepiness. I think it covers everything. And it's called the category ambiguity theory. Yeah, that was... Uh, now, did David Livingstone Smith uh, make this up, or was he just champion this? I think he made it up. Because okay. he wrote about the Knox researchers and said what they're talking about you can call threat ambiguity category or threat ambiguity theory. It, with category ambiguity theory, he didn't cite anybody else. So it seemed to be his own construct. Yeah, so this is the idea. It's sort of like the threat ambiguity uh, in that there is some confusion, but it's not a threat like I think this dude in the coffee shop is going to kill me. It's more like I don't know how to categorize that guy. Right. And that freaks me out. Right. And it's based on what's called um, essentialism. Yeah. Right? Where if you are a member of a species of animal, whether human or raccoon or tiger, there's something about you or there's some collection or set of things about you that that are totally unique to your species. Yeah. It's something you possess because you're a member of that species and because you're a member of that species, you possess these things. And it can be very difficult to put your finger on it, but it's just one of those things that you know when you see it or know when you don't see it, right? Yeah. And there are clear borders between these things. You either have this essence fully or you don't have it at all. You're lacking it. You're missing it and something's really wrong. So in this article, he used um, the example of a wax dummy. Yeah, have you ever been to, like, Madame Tussauds? Sure, yeah. Um, I find that the ones, and again with the eyes, the ones that work the best are the ones where they have sunglasses on. Oh, yeah. You know? Again, Michael Jackson. <laughs> That's right. But the whole point with these wax dummies with the eyes is they're fixed. They're not moving around. The facial expression is locked in. Uh, the skin itself, you know, they, they can only do so much. And Madame Tussauds and museums like that are the best of the best, and they do look pretty good. Mm -hmm. But that's the whole point with the Uncanny Valley is you can't get 99% there and say we're fine. It's that 1% that still gives people the creeps. Exactly. And that's and it, it sums up everything. Like the threat ambiguity could fall into this, whether you're talking about robots, whether you're talking about a half-dog, half-lizard combo, which Livingstone sites or Livingstone Smith sites. The like desert? All, yeah. A dizzard would be creepy when you saw it. Yeah. It, but so things that are a threat are creepy, but there's also things that are creepy that aren't a threat, and this category ambiguity theory figured it out. So if that's true, Chuck, and David Livingstone Smith figured out what is the basis of creepiness, we finally have the independent variable licked in Masahiro Mori's Uncanny Valley graph, and we can get to work. Is he still around? Yeah, he is. I wonder if he's happy about all this. Uh, I get the impression that he's kind of like just whatever, gone off on his own little thing. Okay. And he's fine. He wrote it in 1970 after all, you know. Yeah, I mean. Geez. Almost 50 years ago. Yeah. So he's probably up there. Yeah. Uh, you got anything else? I got nothing else. Good one. Yeah. Well, if you want to know more about the Uncanny Valley, we should say this was based originally on a Grabster article, too. That's right. Uh, but if you want to know more about the Uncanny Valley, come read that Grabster article. You can type Uncanny Valley in the search bar at HowStuffWorks.com. And since I said search bar, it's time for listener mail. Well, and today, it's a very special listener mail. This is Josh edition because you picked out a very special one. I love this one. I'm going to butcher the dude's name, but... That's all right. Take it away. It, it's a good one. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to call this one uh, Email from a Real Irish Historian. Yeah, that feels pretty good, Chuck. <laughs> Am I out of a job? Yeah, maybe. Okay. Hi, guys. I'm a big fan of the show. It's informative and insightful, and I find myself interested in things that I never looked at twice at before. 
One subject that I'd always found fascinating was the correlation between the Native American Choctaw tribe and the people of Ireland. I didn't realize that was a thing, did you? Not at all. This is a story which isn't well known. Okay, which isn't well known outside of some areas of Ireland, and of course within the tribe. But it's a really good story of solidarity between two groups of people, despite being thousands of miles apart. Less than 20 years after the Trail of Tears, which forcibly displaced na- thousands of natives, the Great Famine hit Ireland. During this time, as you know, Ireland was colonized by the British, and the people of Ireland were treated poorly due to the common misconception that Irish Catholics were a lower caliber of human. Uh, he goes on to, to give more examples, but just suffice to say, it was not good for the Irish people during the famine. Word spread to America and to the Choctaw tribe. They sympathized with the Irish people so much that only 15 years after the Trail of Tears, they donated $710 during 1845 to send to Ireland as part of a relief fund. This is estimated to be roughly $68,000 in today's money. This was greatly appreciated by the Irish people, and after the famine, the bond continued. In Cork, we have a sculpture honoring the tribute of the Choctaw people, and in 1990, members of the tribe came to Ireland and walked the famine walk in Mayo to replicate the walk that starving people made to ask the landlord for help. In 1992, an Irish commemoration group walked from Oklahoma to Mission to replicate the Trail of Tears and raised $700,000 to help poverty in Africa. These two groups continue to work together, and to this day, our president is declared an honorary member of the Choctaw tribe, along with the Quakers, who fed Irish people to the point that their members ended starving themselves. The Choctaw tribe remains some of the unsung heroes of the famine story of Ireland. Sorry it went on so long. I'm an Irish historian, so I tend to waffle. Love the show. Best of luck with yourselves. Uh, Royzen Kilroy. Fantastic. Great story. Thanks a lot, Royzen. I'm quite sure that's not the actual pronunciation of your name because there's a lot of accent marks over (laughs) letters that normally aren't. Yeah. Um, So I apologize for that. But I nailed your last name. I'm positive of it. And Josh Clark, three and a half stars. Not bad out of three and a half, right? (laughs) I don't remember. What was Star Search? Is it four stars? Oh, I don't remember. I just just now remembered there was such a thing as Star Search. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, okay, well, you take the end part, Chuck, since I took listener mail. Oh, geez. Uh, thanks for listening. Um, <laughs> hey, if you want to get in touch with us, you can go to our official pages, uh, Stuff You Should Know Podcast. What else? Uh, let's see. If they want to send us an email. Oh, yeah. Email us at stuffpodcast at howstuffworks.com. Mm-hmm. And uh, have a good day. Is that what you say? That's good enough, man. <laughs> All right. Stuff You Should Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.